We believe the internet is the most powerful tool for human progress the world has ever seen. Continuously created by all and governed by none. A global commons that ensures access for everyone. What it enables is nothing short of magic. We believe the internet must remain a space where ideas are born and perspectives are challenged. Where collaboration drives inspiration and debate fuels ingenuity. Where technology empowers creators to unleash innovation at a pace never before imagined. To reach beyond what is possible today. We believe technology that reimagines the way digital teams work sparks humanity's drive to achieve and advance. When we come together to make the internet, we are building the future, turning inspiration into action, freeing us to create experiences that accelerate change and unlock extraordinary performance, kindling our passion to push limits, to explore, to discover, to disregard the status quo and embrace new possibilities in our relentless pursuit of better. Thank you. Bonjour, Lille. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Barry. This is Josh, one of the brilliant minds behind Pantheon. Uh, our upcoming keynote session is about facing fear, right? And Josh and I wanted to discuss a common business fear, which is, besides standing on a stage like this, uh, transitioning digital platforms, right? That's spot on, Barry. And it's fear that holds us back. Fear of breaking things, fear of going over a budget, uh, fear of owning a decision that turns out not to have been a success. But Embracing a new digital platform or a new practice like Pantheon and WebOps is sometimes necessary to achieve the results that we want to see. Right. So, so Josh, you know, can you share with the audience uh, the key impact that uh, Pantheon's WebOps platform can do with businesses navigating the tourist change? Yeah, I, I, so yesterday actually Dries gave this wonderful presentation about Drupal Village and I, I really I found it quite entertaining and also informative. And, I sort of think, you know, Pantheon and WebOps, we look at that and we see a lot of the people in Drupal Village still pouring their own foundations or doing their own plumbing. And our work is to elevate them so they can move more quickly and focus on the house around them and entertaining for their guests. And not just be fast, but also deliver higher quality because they can, they can continue to improve the house after it's first built, not just get stuck with, with whatever was put in place the first time. Right, well, valid points. But what about the macroeconomical situation, right? A lot of companies, they are afraid to invest. They look at every euro or dollar, whatever you want, uh, three, four times before spending it. Yeah, that is absolutely a, a, the question in this environment. But I think our perspective is that only teams that can move fast and with focus can reliably deliver return on investment, because otherwise, you just end up stuck on these never-ending projects that often have questionable business value. Hey, and what about um, data safety? Also an important topic, right? So how does Pantheon uh, ensures that all digital assets will be safe during a transition and well, beyond? Yeah, that, absolutely. Um, you know, we're architected for security. And in addition to the structural integrity that comes with strong foundations and professionally laid plumbing and wiring, uh, you know, we provide great, you know, home security systems to keep all your digital artifacts safe. And as a member of the Drupal Steward program, we participate in the neighborhood watch of Drupal Village, if you will. Right. So one final question, Josh. Thank you. Um, and that's about, you know, small and big companies. You know, they all... For them, the ease of use is vital, right? How does Pantheon ensure a user-friendly experience? So our, our core is built around the developer experience. And our perspective is that a great developer experience that unlocks velocity and iteration is how you get a great user experience. Whether you're thinking about the end user experience of the site 
publicly facing itself, or the Drupal user experience for content editors or site builders. That's something that you need to continually invest in improving based on you know, improvements in the core technology as well as feedback you're getting from others. So that, that ability to get the site live and keep improving it afterwards is critical to that great user experience. It's how great digital projects are built. Makes sense. Thanks, Josh. Well, those were my questions. And before we warmly welcome Sarah, who will share with us uh, her lessons about how to manage fear and stress. I want you all to remember just one sentence about this scripted three-minute dialogue, which is with Pantheon, um, you are able to transition your digital platform fearlessly, efficient, and it will be a very renewable, uh, sorry, a remarkable journey, right? So visit us at our booth and looking forward to meet you all, right? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hello everybody. Um, that was a lukewarm welcome. I've come all the way from London, come on. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. <laughs> I know that's not very far. Actually, I know we've got people from all over the world, so thank you very much uh, for coming and listening to me uh, talk today. And um, I was asked to come and talk to you about leadership. And in particular, that moment when you go from being led to becoming a leader. Because I know that perhaps many of you are familiar with a proprietal system where you're led. But with an open source system, you have the opportunity and the challenge to lead yourself, but also others. So this is the moment for you to stick your head above the parapet and lead into a future which is unknown and full of possibility. And that's terribly exciting, isn't it? It's also kind of terrifying, I think. I was kind of reflecting back on my own leadership journey and some of the highs and the lows, and I was wondering what piece of advice I would have given myself as I was about to embark on my leadership journey. And I think I would have said this, the biggest thing that will get in your way is you. And therefore, the biggest and most important thing that you'll learn is how to get out of your own way so that you can reach your full potential. And then you can figure out how to get out of other people's way so that they can reach their full potential. And if you figure all that out, you're off to a flying start. And truthfully, it took me about 40 years to work that out. <laughs> and uh, I very much doubt that you have the time or the inclination to wait that long. So I'm going to give you the edited highlights of my leadership journey so that you can lead authentically and skillfully and fearlessly. So let me start at the beginning, when I was first promoted to squadron leader and I was selected to do an operational command in Kabul, Afghanistan. And you can probably tell from the photograph what time of year this was. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I'd had a more professional photograph taken, but you know, it was Christmas, so I was feeling jolly. So anyway, um, I've been promoted, and um, my, um, I was there, I was the command detachment, um, or the commander of the detachment. And the mission was, to get people safely from A to B in support of Afghan government forces. So think of us as a battle taxi, basically. And I was in charge of the 120 people that were dedicated to this mission. And I wanted to do a great job. I wanted to be a great leader. I also wanted to be liked. And I think I had this idea that to be an effective leader, I had to be popular. So I did what we all do when we want to be liked. I tried to fit in. I tried to be like everyone else. I tried to be one of the boys, actually, because they were mostly boys. So I tried to do more pull-ups and more press-ups. I tried to fly lower, faster. I would use coarse language, because that's what I thought the boys were doing. I'm not saying that's what they did. It's just what I thought I should do. 
And you know, it works to an extent, but in my experience, the mask will always slip eventually. And I can remember the day it did. It wasn't a particularly remarkable day. It was just another tasking day in Kabul. And I was flying into a helicopter landing site that I'd flown into many times um, during that detachment and even on that day. Now, when you fly in Afghanistan, you always fly as a pair so that you've got someone else to help you out if you get in trouble. So I was actually tucked in as the second aircraft behind the lead aircraft, and we were flying in like this into this landing site. And I flew through a little bit of the downwash of the lead aircraft, and my aircraft started to fall out of the sky. So I pulled in the lever, and that's the thing that makes you go up in a helicopter, basically. So I pulled in the lever, but we're still sinking. We're dropping out of the sky. So I pulled in a bit more, and we're still sinking. So I pulled it all the way up to my armpit, and eventually we arrested our rate of descent. We made a safe landing. And after we landed, I remember my co-pilot, he was junior to me, and he turned to me and he said, you've overpowered the aircraft, and you've overstressed it. You pulled too much power. I couldn't be sure, but he sounded unimpressed. And I remember kind of stowing that away as, he thinks I messed that up. Now, you don't have time to dwell on these things. Um, so I you know, carried on flying the mission, and I, I did it you know, uh, successfully. And I didn't think about it again until I was back in Kabul International Airport, and I was taxiing into my normal parking spot. And I remember, as I came to a stop, my thoughts returned to this comment. And I remember feeling a bit peed off about it, to be honest. So anyway, in the um, Puma helicopter, um, when you bring that to a stop, you apply the tow brakes, and then you pull in the parking brake, which is a bit like a handbrake in a car. And it's quite an old aircraft, so there's a bit of a knack to getting things done. You have to kind of hoik it up and twist it into place. So this is what I did. And I may have used slightly more vigor than normal on account of being annoyed by this comment. So I kind of hoiked it up like that, which would have been fine if it had been the parking brake. But it was the collective lever, the thing that makes you go up in a helicopter. So we cartwheeled about 30 feet into the air at this point. And the Puma's famously, um, this Puma aircraft that I'm talking about, um, it's um, very narrow with a high center of gravity, so it falls over quite easily. So we now imagine this aircraft was going to topple over and we were going to thrash ourselves to death. Fortunately, that didn't happen, and we miraculously landed back on all three wheels, at which point my co-pilot turned to me again and said, so what happened there? At which point I knew he was unimpressed. And that was a point I realized I was so busy thinking about what he thought about me, that I'd nearly killed us. Anyway, we walked back in to do the debrief, debrief the day mission, and then we started to prepare for the night mission, and I started to brief the night mission. And I stood in front of 120 people, and um, I remember just as I was about to brief the night mission, one of my crew said to me, just wanted to check, boss, um, you did have a bit of a shaky experience just there. Are you okay to fly tonight? Um, and I think it was the kind of unexpected kindness that sort of caught me off guard. And I said, yes, I am fine to fly. And as I said the word fly, my voice betrayed me, and it started trembling. And it was really obvious to 120 people that I was fighting back tears. And you could see everyone awkwardly looking at the floor. <laughs> anyway, I thought, goodness, Sarah, you know, pull yourself together. So I did, and I managed to get through that, and we flew the night mission, and it was all fine. And I resolved never to show that kind of emotion ever again, because we were in a war zone, and they needed a strong leader. And I thought I'd got away with it. But when I got home a few months later, I discovered that I had earned myself a nickname. They were calling me Jekyll and Hyde, presumably because I could be a bit moody, and a bit unpredictable. And um, I was devastated by this. I mean, I've been called worse names, honestly, but this one really got to me because I knew it was true. Because I was a bit moody. I am a little bit emotional. 
and I desperately tried to hide it from the people in my team. And the second I had shown them a glimpse of the real me, I'd been rejected. And you might say, I don't think being called a nickname is rejection. And of course, you'd be right. Rejection is very personal. But that's how I took it at the time. Now, the point is, is that even if there were some people that had rejected me, there were other people who I know benefited from my style of leadership, from maybe being a little bit more emotionally transparent or a bit more maternal or you know, feminine or whatever you want to call it. So I think the key point here is that there's no point trying to mold yourself into something you're not, because the real you will shine through eventually anyway. And quite right too, because there are people out there that need you exactly as you are. But notice I've said people, not everyone, because the truth is I'm not everyone's cup of tea. We cannot be everything to everyone all of the time. So there are going to be times that people don't like what you say or do. There are going to be times that you don't feel like the popular kid. So if you want to lead authentically, you need to be able to tolerate a little bit of rejection from time to time. But actually, I want to take that one stage further. I think it's not just enough to tolerate a bit of rejection. I think we actually need to be able to embrace it. And I'll tell you why. So we're still in Kabul, um, but we've been assigned a hostage recovery mission. So a woman had been taken captive, and she had been held hostage for a week. And the powers that be were trying to negotiate her release. And we had the call to say, we need you to go in at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning and go and get this woman out and take her home to safety. So we briefed, we prepared the mission, and I sent my crews to bed for a good night's sleep so that they could be in early in the morning to do this mission. And at midnight, I got a call, and they said, the negotiations have slowed down, and it's not going to happen at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. It's going to happen tomorrow night. So I was looking at a long day for my cruise, and that might not seem significant, but actually it's been proven that error rates go up when you've been on duty for more than 12 hours. So I had to weigh up the operational risk now. And I had a couple of options. I could go and wake them all up and say, go back to sleep, but have a lie-in, and I'll get you back in later. Or I could accept that they were going to have a long day in the knowledge they'd had an unbroken night's rest. So I went with option B. And when they came in in the morning, I said, sorry, there's been a change of plan. Uh, relax for the rest of the day. I'll get you back in later on when I need you. And most people were fine about this. But there were two people who did not like this. And they challenged me. And they said, this is outrageous. What do you expect us to do all day? We can't go back to sleep. And do you know what I said? I said, I don't care. The hostage is our priority. So stop complaining and I'll get you back in when I need you. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, at the time, I believed I'd done the right thing. I'd made a decision, which I think was the right decision, and I needed my whole team to get behind me and execute that decision. And honestly, they were being a bit whiny. But I could have dealt with that more skillfully, because I really wanted to get that woman home. I'm sure you can all you know, feel that sense of urgency that you would feel to get someone home safe. But there's no point sending six people to die to try and save one person. So I had to know that I wasn't unnecessarily compromising the safety of my crews by sending them on a mission at the end of a long day. And the only way I can be sure of that is if people can challenge me. Because when people can challenge you, rather than one person making a decision and six people blindly following your orders, you've got the weight of seven people behind that decision. And you've increased the collective intelligence behind that decision, the buy-in behind that decision, and the probability of success of that mission. So if you translate that back into what you do, think of all the strengths that the people in your team bring to the table. We all have slightly different ways of seeing things and doing things. And you're all brilliant. 
But there's no point having brilliant people in your team if you can't harness that intellectual power. And for that to happen, everybody's got to have a voice. And everyone's got to be able to challenge you. And when they challenge you, you've got to be classy about it so that they do it again. And truthfully, I found that kind of hard. I could be kind of prickly when people challenged me. I could be hostile. And while some people did, I learned later that other people weren't challenging me. They were staying quiet. In other words, I was getting in other people's way. And that's the opposite of the kind of leader that I wanted to be. And I hated myself for that. So why was I doing it? Well, I'll tell you why. Because every time someone challenged me, or called me a nickname, I took that as personal rejection. And the reason I did that is because I believed I deserved to be rejected. And the reason I did that is because deep down, I was scared that I wasn't good enough. And I'm not telling you that so you can feel sorry for me. This isn't a public therapy session, by the way. I'm telling you that because I have lost count of the amount of brilliant people who share this fear in some way. And what's even more tragic about it is that they give themselves a hard time for it too. But let me tell you, giving yourself a hard time for being human doesn't help you grow. It actually makes it worse. So I discovered that the very first thing that we need to do to get out of our own way is to forgive ourselves for being human. And that's easy to say, but it's quite hard to do, particularly with high achievers. So I wanted to share a bit of evidence that will hopefully convince you that you can actually forgive yourself for being human. So believe it or not, our brains are still developing until our mid-20s. Particularly this sort of the cognitive part of the brain that's responsible for kind of uh, processing emotions, okay? So what that means is that as you're growing up, when you go through those childhood disappointments, so the first time you fail an exam or you get dumped by your first love, you don't have the emotional equipment to process that the way that you know, fully grown adults like I do. And so the brain will find that disproportionately painful. And because of that, it develops a fear to make sure that we don't do it again. And that's why we end up with a fear of failure, or a fear of rejection, or a fear of being wrong, or a fear of being right. And these are all just manifestations of this underlying fear of, I'm not enough. Mine manifested as a fear of rejection. And that's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, if you recognize yourself in anything I've just said, can I reassure you that you are not alone? And you're not broken. You're wonderfully human. But the second reason that's important is because we've developed these fears. In other words, we've learned to be afraid of these things. Which means we've learned to be afraid of things that won't kill us. Which means that we can do the things we're afraid of and we'll live. Probably. So what that means is if you want to be the best leader that you can be, you need to do the things that scare you. And in fact, you probably need to do the things that scare you most. And I'm not talking about skydiving here. I'm talking about embracing discomfort. So maybe that is showing up as your true self, or maybe it's inviting challenge or making an unpopular decision. Those things will feel uncomfortable, and that's a good sign. We need to lean in. And there's a couple of scientific reasons as to why we can actually afford to be excited about discomfort. So the first one is, um, we actually do our best work when we are in stretch. So we don't want to be really bored, and we don't want to be totally stressed out either. We want to be just uncomfortable enough. That's where we do our best work, we perform at our best. So please take this as an invitation to be excited when you feel uncomfortable. But the other reason that we can feel excited is it's actually where we do our best learning. So we used to uh, refer to the stages of learning. Maybe some of you are familiar with this. 
So when you learn any new skill, including leadership, because it is a skill we can learn, you start off at unconscious incompetence, i.e., you don't know what you don't know. So you can imagine you'll be brilliant at it. So when I was 12, I watched Top Gun, and I went, that looks brilliant, I'm going to be a pilot. I had no idea if I could fly or if I'd even enjoy it, but I knew I wanted to wear one of those jackets with patches on it, because they're really cool. So off I went, and I joined the Air Force, and then I got into my first cockpit, and I went, I have no idea how to fly this thing. <laughs> and those people over there, they all seem to know what they're doing. That's the uncomfortable moment, isn't it? It's also the moment where we go, oh, I've got imposter syndrome. I can't do it. And we have this overwhelming tendency to assume that we're broken and that we have to cure imposter syndrome so that we can actually progress. But actually, it's just a sign that we've reached the phase of conscious incompetence. And we can use that phase to identify the gaps in our knowledge and maybe to use the other people around us who seem to be further along to help us to learn and grow. So don't let imposter syndrome get in your way, and don't use it as an excuse to stay in your comfort zone. Push into discomfort and descend through the stages of learning. And every time you do that, you are training your brain. You are teaching it. Actually, I can do the things that are scary or difficult, and I can survive them. And every time, you're actually kind of rewiring your brain. And that means that you're actually continually evolving, not just into the best version of you, but someone who has self-trust and self-confidence. And that means that the next time you get in your own way, because you will, because we're human, or the next time someone else gets in your way, you have everything you need to push through. And you might surprise yourself at what you're capable of. Um, so believe it or not, um, I was actually the first female helicopter pilot to fly special forces in the United Kingdom. And um, some people clap at that, by the way, but no. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever claps, and I always make them clap, just so you know. <laughs> anyway, um, I was the first um, British female helicopter pilot to fly special forces, but I remember at the start there was a little bit of, rep, um, a little bit of resistance. Sorry, I remember them saying to me, uh, you know, girls can't fly special forces. And I said, why can't they? And they said, well, you would compromise the mission. Because if the helicopter gets in trouble in the middle of a mission, they're going to have to protect you. Well, they won't be able to help themselves because you're a woman. So you would compromise the mission. Um, so I challenged this. I said, are you sure about that? Would you mind asking the special forces what would happen in this scenario? And to their credit, they did. And this was the response that came back. They said, if the helicopter goes down in the middle of a mission, you're not going to see us. We're going to be running faster than any of you can run towards our target. And look, you know, I'm certainly not going to glorify military action at this point, but I need to be real with you about what was going on. And the missions they were going on were judged to be the highest strategic importance to global security. And these missions have been months, sometimes years in the planning, and they've got a window this big to complete their mission. So they're not going to switch their focus at this point to babysitting pilots. They're going to stay focused on their mission. And I don't mind admitting, at this point, there was a bit of an uncomfortable moment for us as we realized these big, strong people weren't going to become our personal bodyguards. But I also remember feeling really proud because these incredibly capable people believed that I could step up to the mark, even though it was uncomfortable. And I thought, do you know what? I reckon I can, actually. So off I went and flew Special Forces missions. And the point is this, is that we are far more capable than we often give ourselves credit for. So we just need to lean into a little bit of discomfort to do it. And don't wait for someone else to go first. Don't wait for someone to blaze that trail for you. Just do it. And if someone else gets in your way, be prepared to challenge them, because they might not know what they're talking about. 
Now, truth time. There's going to be some mistakes along the way. Actually, mistakes are not a bad thing, but we tend to resist that as human beings. And I want to、um, show you why. So, this is an example of one airliner nearly landing on another airliner in Barcelona in 2014. And this is what happened eight years later. Exactly the same incident, different airline, different airport, but another airliner nearly lands on another airliner. Now, what are you thinking at this point? You might be thinking, well, they've not learned from their mistakes, right? I taught air safety at the Defence Academy of the UK for three years and showed this footage. And for three years, everyone said, well, they haven't learned from their mistakes. But think about how many takeoffs and landings have happened in that intervening period thousands, millions probably. And none of them were serious because of the recovery actions of the crew. And yet, our instinctive response is often to say, oh, well, we're not learning. And that's because the brain. Um, kind of、um, is wired to think negatively. So we tend to disregard positive information and therefore will assume that mistakes are a sign we're not learning. But it's actually the opposite, which is true. It's the ones who are afraid of making mistakes that don't learn. Imagine if I said to you now, don't touch that. What are you going to want to do? You're going to want to touch it, aren't you? Because we learn from doing, don't we? And because the brain operates on it, if it's not broken, don't fix it. We tend to do our best learning when we get it wrong. Now, I'm not saying that's an excuse to be careless. I know nobody wants to make mistakes, but being ruled by a fear of making mistakes will not help you grow. And if you want to accelerate your growth and your innovation, then you need to rethink what growth looks like. And it looks like this having the courage to try things that other people find too scary or too difficult. Leaning into discomfort and then accepting that there are going to be some mistakes. And the good news is, is that you can absolutely turn those mistakes into learning. The key is what you do with them. And two things need to happen. First of all, we need to take ownership of that mistake because you can't learn from it if you're in denial about it. The second thing that needs to happen is we need to share it so that we multiply the learning. And this is where being the best version of you actually leads beautifully into the best version of collaboration. Because you're part of a community of developers. And if you want to innovate better and faster with more success, then the key is collaboration. And the best way to do that is actually to share mistakes. Because if you think about it, mistakes tend to be human in nature. It's rarely technology that fails these days. Even if it is, it's probably because of kind of input error, right? So, it's usually humans that make mistakes, and we're all human, which means we can all learn from your mistakes. But I get that's easier said than done, right? I've made lots of mistakes in my career, and I talk very openly about my mistakes, and I'm very comfortable doing it. But I wasn't always. So, let me share with you how I first gained the courage, I suppose,、um, to start sharing. So, we were in、uh, Kenya.、Um, we were out there doing dust training. When you、um, fly in sandy environments and you get close to the ground, you kick up all the sands and you can't see where you're going. So, you have to practice very special techniques. So, we were out there practicing these dust landings. And I was the instructor, and I had a student who was doing the flying. And、um, basically, he was sort of flying these approaches out in this, you know, the middle of the desert. And after he'd done a few approaches, We'd actually blown all the dust away. So it was too easy. You could see where you were going. So, what we did is we actually changed our approach angle by about 10 degrees so that we could kick up new dust on the way into our landing point. And、uh, when we landed, I noticed that around the helicopter, there were a few sort of twigs and leaves on the floor. And I looked back and left of our approach lane, and I could see this tree, and its branches were looking a bit. Mangled. And I realized we probably trimmed this tree on the way down with our rotor blades. Now, this is a battlefield helicopter. It's very robust. And I looked in at my engine instruments, nothing's overheating. I got airborne, flew the aircraft a bit, all seems to be flying fine. 
So we agreed that the aircraft was fine, and we completed the mission. And when I got back to my um, forward operating base, I got on the sat phone to my boss, and I said, just wanted to let you know that we uh, had a small incident with a tree. And at this point, I heard a sigh on the end of the line, and he said, oh, I've got 120 soldiers to move tonight. I need every helicopter. And I said, no, no, it's fine. The helicopter is definitely airworthy, so we can fly that mission tonight. He said, OK, fine. And about 20 minutes later, um, another pilot came in who had had a look at my aircraft, and he said, I would like you to explain to me on what planet you think that air aircraft is airworthy. So a quick physics lesson. This is what a rotor blade is supposed to look like from the side. You can see it looks like a wing. It's a mini wing. It spins really fast, creates lift. The reason it creates lift is because the air has to travel further over the top, so it travels faster, which creates low pressure, which creates lift. In other words, the shape of the rotor blade is quite important. You probably know what's coming. This is what mine look like. Definitely not airworthy. So at this point, <clears throat> we cancelled the mission, and they conducted an inquiry. They said, we're quite curious to know how you hit the tree, but we're really curious to know why you thought that aircraft was OK to fly. And I stuck to my story. I said, well, you know, it's a robust helicopter. The engine instruments were all fine. It was flying fine. And I remember it was at this point my boss looked straight into my soul. And he said, really? Are you sure you didn't know that it was damaged? And at this point, I hung my head, because the second I'd seen those leaves on the floor, I knew it was bad. But I was so embarrassed that I'd let it happen. I just didn't want it to be true. So I lied to myself. And in doing so, I endangered the lives of my crew by flying a badly damaged aircraft. And I thought, how am I ever going to admit that I knowingly risked the lives of my crew because I was too proud to admit I'd made a mistake. I don't think I can do that. And that was the moment my boss did something amazing. He went first. He said, actually, Sarah, I'd like to apologize because I put pressure on you to fly the aircraft that night, and that must have made it hard for you. Now, honestly, I don't think he owed me an apology, but I do remember thinking that was a really classy thing to do, to take responsibility for his part in it and to apologize. And I remember thinking it was a brave thing to do. And I wanted to be brave. So I gave my first speech, really, um, to a room full of pilots who looked about as impressed as you look right now. <laughs> I don't blame you at this point. Um, and I told them everything I've just told you. And afterwards, I said, OK, are there any questions? And a hand was raised at the back, and this person said, actually, I don't have a question. I've got something I'd like to say to you, though. OK. I did something really similar myself just last week. And then someone over there said, actually, I did something like that, too. And people started sharing their mistakes. And I realized in that moment that being excellent at what you do isn't about getting it perfectly right every time. It's about having the courage to take responsibility for your mistakes and then sharing them with other people. And the reason I'd found the courage is because my boss had shown me the way. And he'd gone first. And you are all embarking on your leadership journey. So you can do the same thing. So try this. Share a mistake that you made with a colleague or someone in your community, because not only will they benefit from the learning, but actually they'll probably be inspired by your courage, and they'll share their mistakes too. Now, um, I've been talking a lot about uh, you know, getting out of your own way and getting out of other people's way. I'm really passionate that that is actually, really, when you boil leadership down, that's what it kind of comes down to. But there's a third 
stage that I want to share with you, and that's helping other people get out of their own way. And you might recall, at the start, I said, I was quite preoccupied with being liked. I was worried about fitting in. It could really get in the way sometimes. And I imagined for a long time I was the only one that had to deal with that fear. But I think my greatest breakthrough in leadership was realizing that I was less um, different than I imagined. And actually, everyone's going through the same stuff as you, which means that you can use your own fear and your own experience to understand what other people in your team are going through and therefore lead more intuitively. So we're still in Kenya, but this time we're on Kazivak um, notice. So that means that if there are any injuries, because the army were out there training, we would go and pick them up and take them down to Nairobi Hospital. For some reason, they trusted me with another helicopter. Don't ask why. But anyway, we got a call in the middle of the night to tell us that a soldier had been bitten by a black mamba. Anyone know how long you've got with one of these? Not long. Yeah. We, we went with the golden hour. Funnily enough, I did this talk for vets recently, and they went, it's 45 minutes. Anyway. <laughs> um, but we were working on an hour. So we knew we had to get the medic to the soldier's side within 60 minutes, or the soldier is dead, right? Now, this is the middle of the night in the mountains of Kenya. And when you fly at night in a helicopter, you have night vision goggles. If you want to imagine what that's like, get two toilet roll tubes and look through them, OK? But it basically turns everything green, and it means you can see where you're going. And it works by amplifying the ambient light, so street lights from nearby towns, um, moonlight, even starlight. But this is the middle of the mountains. There are no towns, no street lights. And it was a snowstorm, so there was total cloud cover. So there was no moon and no starlight. So what we were looking at was this. Incredibly uncomfortable, but actually well below the normal operating limits to even get airborne. But the soldier's going to die. So what do you do? Well, we decided to get airborne. The next challenge is that he was on the side of a mountain. That's not an aviation map, by the way. That's uh, my depiction of what it looked like. Um, but he's where X is. And normally at night, we would fly at 250 feet, which for reference is about the height of a 23-story building. Okay, that building also was not there. Um, but I hope you can see, if we'd done that, we would have been in cloud. And you can't see where you're going in cloud. And this cloud's got a mountain hiding in it. So that would have been disastrous. So the only hope that we had of getting to our casualty was to fly below the normal operating height. Now, it's not been wrecked. We don't know what's down there. And it's really dark. But the soldier's going to die. What do you do? So we kept going. Uh, the next challenge, so as I say, in mountainous terrain, uh, which is what we were, um, this is um, looking kind of bird's eye view. And so normally when you go on holiday in an airliner, you fly a three degree glide path to a flat runway. But actually when you're flying in the mountains, uh, you fly a level approach and you use the mountain as your um, gradient, essentially, so that you've got references to fly along. So this is what I was doing. So I had the mountain right outside my cockpit window, and I was flying alongside like this. But if you remember, it was really dark, so I couldn't see the hill that was right outside my window. Now, in the Puma helicopter, you've got two side doors down the back that the troops jump out of. And my crewman said, what about if I hang out of the side of this door on my monkey harness, and then I shine this big light, and then I can sort of tilt my tail into the side of the hill, and I can kind of crab down the side of this hill, flying down this beam. So a bit like that. Now, this is not standard. It's not been practiced. But our soldier's going to die. So we decided to give it a go. And it kind of worked. And we got to 0 0.01 on the GPS, so we knew our soldier must be somewhere just in front of us. And at that point, two things happened. I started to lose sight of the top of the rotor blades. 
we were about to go into cloud. And the second thing that happened is the low height alarm went off, which meant we were about one second from hitting the ground. So at that point, I dived into the low ground and I took my escape. Now, at this point, my heart is going like this, okay? I have nearly flown us into the side of that hill. I can't go any higher because of the cloud. I definitely can't go any lower, or I will spread us across the side of that hill. But the soldier's going to die. What do you do? Well, we went round again, and again, and again, trying everything we can think of, and every time the same thing is happening, and I am nearly hitting the ground. And after 45 minutes, I said, I'm really sorry, but we're going to have to go home. And we left that man on the hill, and we flew home in complete silence. And when we landed, my crew said to me, we would have backed whatever decision you made. But we were so relieved when you finally said that you were turning around. And I looked at them, and they were all shaking. And it surprised me. I thought I'd been the only one that wanted to turn back. But I realized in that moment, they would have followed me into the side of that hill. And that taught me a profound and humbling lesson about what it is to be human. Because I was afraid of what people would think of me if I left that man on the hill and he died. And if I'm honest, I was probably more afraid of that than I was of actually leaving that man <laughs> behind and the consequences of that. And you know what? I think that's exactly what they were afraid of too. That's why they didn't say anything. Because we are more afraid of things that won't kill us than things that will kill us. And sometimes, leaning into discomfort means admitting you're scared of what people will think about you. And the truth is, is that everybody is just as scared as you are about things like that. And you can use your fear to understand what other people might be scared of, and therefore what they might need from you in that moment. And what they needed from me in that moment was to go first and make an unpopular decision to leave a man behind so that we could live. So try this. Go first. When you do that, you're saying, I'm just as scared as you are, but we're in this together, and I'll lead the way. So I said at the start um, that uh, my promise, really, was how to lead fearlessly. Um, <laughs> The truth is, is that we're all kind of born with this ability. Um, it's life that teaches us to be afraid, as we've learned, which means that everyone is going through this together and everyone is just as scared as you. And actually, when I reflect on that, I realize um, that was true when I was looking back through my military career. You know, everyone was going through it together. You know, all those times I tried to mold myself to being someone that I wasn't. I realize now, I didn't fool anyone. They had my number from the get-go. And when they were challenging me or calling me names, that wasn't actually them rejecting me. That was them saying, we see you as you are, but we're with you anyway. <laughs> so years before I'd learned to accept myself for me, they'd already done it, which is proof that we are brilliant at getting in our own way. But whether you believe it or not, there are people out there who are rooting for you. So go out there and do your thing. Do the things that scare you most. Show up as your authentic self. Invite people to challenge you. Make an unpopular decision. And go first. Because the amazing thing about that is when you do that, other people will follow your lead. Because fear is contagious but so is bravery. And quite right, too, because there are people out there that need you exactly as you are. Thank you for listening.
Honestly, after this talk, I'm absolutely speechless. <laughs> so it's yeah. good that other people actually providing us with the questions to ask <laughs> because I'm absolutely overwhelmed and that was, that was wonderful. Thank you so much you. for sharing your experience and your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, that was very touching. It was really true to heart. And even though the, um, the examples, I mean, are not of our world, but I think to some extent we can certainly relate to uh, some of the things that we do when we engage in open source, work together with people we don't know and so forth. So yeah, thank you for that. So we have uh, questions in the app. If you go to the track, uh, you can actually post your questions that you have for Sarah. Um, there are already some questions that we have. Um, so you've been uh, as a pilot in the RAF. Yes. As a commit pilot, how was it for you to engage in like the digital realm um, and uh, in your workshops at all? Um, in the digital realm, what was the last thing yeah, you said? So, so during your workshops, mm -hmm. uh, during COVID, doing them digitally, mm. so forth. Yes, okay. So the helicopter rifle was 40 years old. Um, it did have a software update, um, but yes, I would probably not class myself as someone who was um, particularly gifted at technology. And I think the thing about COVID is for people like me, we were forced to level up, you know, and like, I learned about Zoom, you know, and, and, and meetings online. And, um, and I was quite resistant to it, if I'm honest. I wanted to stick with face-to-face, -face, um, and I put a lot of effort into justifying the old ways. And it's funny, like I say, we get in our own way, and if we could channel that effort into actually just embracing the future, we'd be better off. But you know, eventually I realized it was worth the effort, and also I realized that um, I was probably just scared of you know, something I don't understand. But actually, you know, I think what I've learned is the fear will never go away. You'll always find something to be afraid of. Um, but you learn not to be afraid of being afraid, and you, know, you just sort of just kind of push on through it. So I think it was a really good lesson, and that's why, even though what I'm talking about is flying related, it's incredibly relevant to technology. It's incredibly it's relevant to, to anything that we do because we're all human beings at the end of the day. Absolutely. Yeah, so, and uh, when talking about, like, you know, pushing forward, so how do you know, being a leader, being a boss of the, of the team, right, uh, how do you know where when to push forward and mm. when to stop and listen and um, take into account the feedback that your, your people provide? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question. And that is something um, that you, you will inevitably learn and you will inevitably learn through a bit of trial and error. Um, I would say, so let's take the, um, the Black Mamba uh, as an example. Um, after we landed and they admitted that they'd wanted to turn back. That would have been a great moment for me to dig a bit deeper and go, why didn't you say anything? What is it about that mission or about me as a leader? What is it? Um, you know, and this, we got away with it this time, but or, you know, um, nobody died, by the way. The soldier was fine, just in case you were, some of you have forgotten about the soldier already, but <laughs> uh, he was fine. Here, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I'll come back to that in a minute. But um, you know, when you're safe on the ground, and it's not um, time sensitive, um, or it's not an operational, you know, it's not safety critical, those are great times to go, right, no one's gonna die if we spend a bit of time collaborating now. Let's ask some really brave questions about what wasn't being said, why weren't we speaking up? And I didn't do that, and that was probably a failure of leadership. In the moment, me making the decision to turn around and fly home, I think that was the right thing to do. So, you know, that's when people get behind you and execute your plan. But when you're on the ground, so to speak, that's a great time um, to collaborate and ask you know, some brave questions. Yeah, thank you. Great, so uh, you were the boss of teams. Yes. Uh, what will you do when you're not a boss and your leader is not accepting feedback? What's the trick there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, okay, I think there's a couple of things. And I do get asked this question a lot, you know, and some people even refer to toxic leadership, um, and it's out there, it exists. Okay, so what can you do? Um, I think first of all, I would start with the assumption no one gets out of bed to be a bad leader. So they've probably got something going on that is causing them to be like that. 
And the reason that I'm so honest about my own feelings as a leader is because I want people to see that it wasn't a desire to be bad, it was my own fear. So if they're a toxic leader, they're probably more scared than you are, believe it or not. So if you want to approach it in a really enlightened way, you can maybe think, well, what is it they're scared of? Uh, maybe it's they're scared of looking stupid, right? So then you can <laughs> plant the idea and then let them decide that it was their idea. You know, I had a boss that his, he would used to sort of shout at me and go, no, Sarah, we're not doing it. But I, I learned that if I just gave him the idea and gave him a couple of weeks to think about it, he'd come back to me and go, we're going to do this. And I'd be like, great, fine. Yeah, that's great because we're, there's a lot of agencies and digital service providers here. We are leaders ourselves, but a lot of us also have leaders. So I think that's, that's a great uh, suggestion and a tip for both sides of the table, right? Also, you were uh, talking today about staying out of your, your own way. Mm -hmm. So what's, uh, what's your mantra? What's your way of doing that? <laughs> How do you achieve that? Yeah, it's a, yeah and I think it's a really good question, it's really making me think. Um, I think you have to be aware of how you're getting in your own way in the first place. So if you, and actually I study, I study and practice mindfulness and I find that's such a good way. If you start with a bit of self-awareness, um, you, you start to notice where there's tension points in the mind and you'll just feel, you know, for me it's in my chest and I feel myself resisting something and I can feel myself pushing back against something and that's usually me getting in my own way. And then, you know, mindfulness has really helped me to kind of see it, accept it and then just just let it go. You don't have to engage with it. You don't have to fuel it. So I think, you know, a little bit of um, work on yourself really helps. And then you can see where you're finding those tension points. Yeah. So basically, you have to understand yourself in yes. order to not to, I don't know, understand yourself be on your way. And forgive yourself as well. You know, yeah. it's really easy to then go, why am I doing this? Because you're a human being. And actually, it's probably because you care about this. So understand yourself, forgive yourself, and then just go and do it anyway, <laughs> basically. So Wonderful. So we have like one thing that us tech folks uh, are afraid of sometimes is to submit a bug report, something that is wrong with the software with our name on it and all. Mm. So in case they did something wrong and it's not a bug, right? So they file the report, mm. something is wrong, and it's not wrong after all. Mm. That's a fear that some of us might have. What do you suggest for them to do? Yeah, and look, I totally understand that. And that's why you know, I shared the story about me not wanting to share my own you know, very human mistake. Um, and I totally get that. And there was a bit of me that was embarrassed, but there was a bit of me that was scared on how it would come back on me because you are relying on, you are hoping that you won't be badly punished for admitting that. Um, and there is no easy answer. There's only a brave answer. Um, you set the conditions for people to be accepting of mistakes by going first. Um, you know, hopefully you will, you will inherit a culture where that growth mindset exists. But if you don't, you can create it. Now, that's not easy, um, but no one said it was easy being a trailblazer. So I think you, know, you create the mindset around mistakes and you start by, by sharing your own mistakes. Also, the people are wondering, do you still fly? <laughs> yeah, I do get asked that question a lot. Um, uh, no, I don't. I don't fly. I, don't fly. I, I do this full time. Hopefully that was obvious from the way I spoke on stage. <laughs> um, and, um, and actually, um, I give this my full attention and I love it. And I, and I love being able to share some of the learning that I got in the military with people outside for a couple of reasons. Um, one is... The Air Force was brilliant, uh, and it, you know, and I enjoyed it. But it is nice to step out of your world and discover new worlds. And I learn so much from the people that I work with, and I find that I am more intellectually stimulated now than I ever was. So I, I think it's a real privilege. But also, I'm aware that you know some of you have maybe paid some UK taxes, and I have crashed a few helicopters, uh, and I'm sort of trying to give back a little bit, <laughs> a little bit that I've taken out. So uh, thank you very much for, for supporting me. <laughs> uh, so, and also, I don't fly because I kept crashing. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe we have one or two more questions that we can put into time. Um, so let me see here. So there's quite a few questions coming in. 
What kind of character traits should a leader have? Do you think you are born with them or can you learn them? Oh, I love this question. Um, so I remember early on someone described me as a uh, natural leader. Um, and it's funny because I, um, I had quite an ego about that, which is strange that you would feel um, proud of yourself for something you've done nothing to work at whatsoever. But anyway, it is one of those ideas that I was brought up with, like, you know, you're a born leader, you're a natural leader. The more I understand about leadership, the less I think it is. Now, of course, there will be certain things that might predispose you. And I think, um, I don't know if confidence is something you're born with, but I probably was, you know, for my age, fairly confident and fairly assertive. And I think for that reason, from a young age, I was selected for leadership type roles. So from the age of you know, 12, when I joined the Air Cadets, I was doing leadership, which meant that by the time I joined the Air Force, I've been doing it for six years. You know, so when your kids are at school, whatever, and they're putting themselves forward to be prefects. So I think, actually, the being born for it, you might have certain character traits, which means that you're more likely to be selected for leadership to, um, responsibilities early on, and that gives you a head start. But I think the bulk of it comes from learning, actually. Um, and I also think I've learned as much about leadership since I've left the military as I did when I was in. I think I've learned more about influence, more about understanding the human condition, um, you know, more about getting out of people's way, whereas the military was very much like, this way, follow me. Um, so I think it's a constant journey, um, and I think if I was to sum up a leadership journey, I would say the first step is put yourself out there, because you've got to expose yourself to it to learn. Um, know thyself so that you can get out of your own way and then get out of other people's way. Brilliant. Good. And when you were just starting as a pilot, so what, what really kept you motivating? Because as you say, like it was challenging mm -hmm. and uh, you were challenged, actually. Uh, yeah, what kept me motivated? It's a great question. I think that's a really important question because I think intrinsic motivation is really important. Um, uh, and I think it changes. You know, did I join because I wanted to serve my country? Yeah, I mostly joined because of Top Gun, if I'm honest. Because uh, <laughs> I thought it looked cool and I wanted to be cool. Uh, what kept me going? Um, people told me I was cool, <laughs> basically. Um, you don't have to dig very deep. It was, but yeah, what kept me going? I think it probably was that sense of doing, we felt like we were doing a good thing. We were helping to keep people safer. Um, and we were pulling together through difficult times. You know, we were going to unpleasant, you know, situations or conditions. And that kind of, that sense of shared almost suffering, but for, you know, for the greater good. I think that's a difficult feeling to beat. Um, you know, you've, it's a real privilege to be able to do something that you genuinely are passionate about. Um, and that was much more important than the actual flying. It was that sense of having a purpose, I suppose. Thank you. Brilliant. So I think we've uh, uh, gone through most of our time. Um, I want to thank you for your very inspiring story. Um, you'll be here for another 30 minutes or so, so if anyone has, have, has had a question that you were afraid to ask, there's 30 minutes left. Uh, thank again, Sarah, for your inspiring story, for coming here and uh, sharing that with us today. Thank you. Thank you, very thank much. you so very much, Sarah.